bows and every tongue confesses that you, Yeshua, you are Lord. And we bless you. We bless you. And we honor you, O oh God. say something to me he said tell the people that this is not the time that the enemy shall be allowed to exalt himself to make him out as if he is greater for he has lifted himself up and he shall be continually brought down low this is the time that God shall arise. This is the time that God shall arise. And men will know that He is God. Lord, we worship you. We worship you. How many of you are here, those of you that are watching, and, and you just feel like the devil's been pushing you around? You feel some kind of attack. It's okay against your life maybe it's against your family against your finances maybe it's against your health but I want to tell you something Goliath was running his mouth for 40 days and 40 nights non-stop to the point where it scared and paralyzed one of the greatest armies on the face of the earth and nobody wanted to do anything but David said something, and he had a slingshot. And what did he say? Do you remember? He said, who is this, watch this, uncircumcised Philistine? In other words, he's saying, who is this that's violating my covenant? Who is this that's trying to challenge my body when Yeshua healed me? Who is this that's trying to attack me when God has given me the victory through the blood of Yeshua? Who who is this that is trying to divide my marriage? Who is this that is trying to attack my finances? The God of provision has already made the way. Some of you, you need to take your slingshot. And it's in your mouth. And you need to use it and say, who are you, you foul devil? Come on, those of you that are watching, who are you, you foul, uncircumcised devil? You are challenging my covenant and you lose because the covenant has already been sealed and ratified by Yeshua's blood. You know what David did? He slung that uh, slingshot and that rock took him out. But do you think there was just a rock that took him out? Come on, there was something divine connected to it. And it was when David reminded God of his covenant. Come on, what happened with Elijah? When the false prophets of Baal and Jezebel, come on, we're seeing the same thing. Fake news, lies, deception, the media, the Jezebel spirit that thinks it can, can take control. You remember what Abraham prayed? Before the fire fell, he said, I speak to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. What was he doing? He was reminding God that there is covenant positional power to defeat every assignment and devil and to wipe them out. I want you that are under some kind of assignment right now, just lift up your hands. If you're here, and I want someone to touch touch them, just put your hand on them. I'm going to pray for you, and I'm going to pray for those that are that are watching right now. Come on, I want you to pray for those people as if you were under attack. And I want you to speak the blessing, Father. We speak over every person right now that their hands are at. You can you can you can put your hands down so you don't get tired. I want you to listen to them pray for you. And those of you that are watching right now, I speak and I declare: Who are these uncircumcised? devils who are these demons that come to challenge our covenant who and what are these incantations that think that they can arise against us at this time we call upon the very god of our covenant to come and to sever 
to destroy every satanic altar where our names are being mentioned and we call on the fire of God himself to burn destroy those incantations and to destroy every assignment through the anointing of the Spirit of God that destroys every yoke and undoes every heavy burden. We command every giant to fall. We command every assignment to be rendered powerless. And we call upon the God of our covenant, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and of the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua. And we speak health. We speak wholeness. We speak life. We speak preservation, deliverance, victory, prosperity. Oh, Father, we loose it now upon the people. Touch them through your grace, through your mercy, and by the help of your hand that is not too short that it cannot help them or save them. We say from this moment forward, the heads of the giants are cut off. The satanic onslaughts and assignment are rendered powerless. We rebuke every tracking spirit and we command it to be severed and stopped. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord rebukes you, every devil. Now get out of their bodies. Get out of their minds. Get out of their finances. Get out of their homes, their marriage. Get away from their children. Get away from their vehicles and their possessions. We stop you, we resist you, we rebuke you in the name of our Lord God, Yeshua. And I speak from this moment forward. The blessing of God prevails. And every assignment is no more. And I pray a covering of the grace of God himself to be upon you. Be free. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Some of you just need to take a deep breath. I sense the Spirit of God. Father, breathe into them afresh. Come on. Some of you just need to take a deep breath. Say, Lord, I, I receive refreshing that comes from the Spirit of God. Thank you, Lord. We worship you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There's somebody over right here, man. I just heard the Lord say, tell them. There's somebody over here. You've had some uh, tests on your heart. And there's been different things that they've said regarding your heart. And I just saw God literally take your heart. And it's like he put his hands around it. And it's like he's squeezing it. And, and there's something generational that has come down through the bloodline. And it's trying to attack your heart. And I see as God is grabbing your heart he's breaking the power of that thing that I speak wholeness over you over your heart over your life in Yeshua's name thank you Lord I see God doing something with cancer over in this section right here there's been some kind of cancerous diagnosis and I see the Lord just absolutely touching you and eradicating it. I rebuke every cancer cell. I command it in the authority of Yeshua's name. Come out! And loose them. And I stretch the healing power of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Somebody right over in this section here. This has been happening over the last few nights of sleep that you've been awakening awakening or awakened to almost like trying to catch your breath and it scared you there's a name for that that sounds right even though I'm not hearing that but that sounds right I just know there's a, whatever the name is you fall devil you loose the people and I say they'll never die in their sleep and they'll live long and strong upon the earth come on if that's you take a deep breath just we say as they take a deep breath uh, life and the breath of God drives out every evil entity in Yeshua's name thank you Lord 
I'm not going to call this person out, but there's a woman in here and there's another one watching where you are, it's like your period, your time of the month. It's just like you've been continually bleeding and you can't figure out what's going on. In the name of Yeshua, I speak to that cycle and I command it to be regulated in the authority of Yeshua's name. And from this moment right now, even as it was with the woman with an issue of blood, that blood stopped, it stops now and becomes regulated. And whatever is causing it, I speak to it and I say, be thou made whole in Yeshua's name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Somebody over in this section here, you could raise your hand on this one if you want. But the other day, you just bent down and grabbed kind of like your stomach area. It's like, whoa, what is that? It was really painful. Whatever that is, touch your stomach right now. I command that to never happen again. I command the healing power of God goes into your body. No pain. In fact, Father, I speak over everyone in the sound of my voice. No medical emergencies. No hospital stays. Un no unneeded surgeries, Lord God. I speak divine life and divine health over them and upon them and for them. Thank you, Jesus. He's calling for me. That's like, you know, incredible. He goes, yeah, bring your wife and bring those other people there. Sorry. <laughs> you're, Bob, you're another people. So anyway. So, so Benny started prophesying over Brenda and I, and I told this to Benny a few years ago. I said, I said, Brother Benny, do you realize that, that you prophesied that over our ministry doing what it is today? Oh, my goodness. Oh, you know. But anyway, and then he prophesied over you, then that we would be working together in the ministry. Here we are. So he was one of the vice presidents, by the way, at Mutual Omaha. He helped manage, uh, remember that one guy? This is Marlon Perkins. <laughs> so him and Marlon were great friends. He knew Jim. Remember that? This is Marlon Perkins. Notice my awesome bravery as Jim wrestles the porpoise with a piece of dental floss. And all the millennials are going, Marlon who? Perkins? Didn't that restaurant close? Anyway, let's, uh, let's go to Isaiah 54. So, there you go. What kind of message are we going to have here today? This is... All right. So it wasn't it great, by the way, to have James Ward last week? Yeah. Yeah, he, he's amazing. He's a good friend. So we, he's coming to OTH, so make sure you register. I'd hate to ask you how many people in here haven't registered because, you know, I don't want to do that to you. But if you're here and you haven't registered, uh, please do. Please. Okay. All right. We're going to talk about a redemptive plan. Here we go. Let's go to Isaiah 54. By the way, Pastor Doug and Eileen, welcome back. They're on vacation. So we, we missed you. We missed you. All right. For a small moment... God speaking, I forsook you or forsaken thee. But with great mercies will I gather thee. And this is what I want you to see. Notice the contrast, the small moment, but great mercy. Okay, what's greater? God's mercy. Now watch this. For a small moment, I have uh, forsaken you, but with great mercy I'll gather thee. And let's go to the next one. Watch this. And in a little wrath, I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on you, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. Now underline the Lord thy Redeemer. Why did he put that in there? Because not only the first part, but what you're about to read. He wants you to understand that he is a God of redemption. And redemption means he's the God that interjects himself to bring a plan of help and a plan of hope. And the greatest redemptive plan ever, it was determined even before uh, man was created. The Bible says that uh, Jesus was determined that he would be the lamb slain. He'd have to go and carry out the greatest redemptive plan ever. He'd have to give his life. And so he's telling you, he said, look, it's about, yeah, I can, I get angry, but, but it's the little wrath compared to my everlasting covenant kindness. Which would you rather have? Would you rather have God be a God of great wrath and hardly any kindness? Or would you like, hey, you know, you know a little wrath, but man, everlasting kindness. And this is important now. Listen to me, those of you that are watching and, and you that are here. You know, what people struggle with in their life, and we had a great conversation with Pastor Matt yesterday. We just like to call each other on the phone, and Mom, you know, gets on the phone with us, and we, we, we just get in the Bible together. And Matthew is asking really, really hard questions because he's out there among the millennials. And I said to Matthew something that I think is so key. I said, Matthew, you know what the problem with a lot of people, whether it be the young millennials or, or older people, they don't know God. Now, they know about God, or maybe you've asked Jesus in your heart, but do you really know God? 
And, and I said this to him. I said, you know, I've walked with God since 1984, and I know him. I've walked with him for 40 years. And when I say I know God, I know God. I know his personality. I know his character. I hear his voice. I sense his leading. I know when I hurt him. I know when I make him mad. I know when I make him happy. I know when he's smiling on me. Why? Because there is a real commitment that he has towards me and I have towards him. And when you know God's character, it will help you when you see things in the earth that are crazy. When it looks like the world is falling apart, you'll remind yourself, wait a minute, who's the one that created that earth? Who's the one that created the heavens and, and, and the earth and the sun and the moon and the stars? God did. And if he was so wise to be able to do that, he is wise enough to handle the things that are happening. So you've got to know God's character, and you've got to know the consistency. He is the Lord, thy Redeemer. And as long as the Holy Spirit is in the earth, he will always have a redemptive plan. He'll always have a plan of help and hope. All right, look here, verse 9. So God's setting this up, the Lord thy Redeemer. For this is as the waters of Noah was unto me. For as I've sworn that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, I've sworn that I would not be angry with you. I won't rebuke you. In other words, God's saying, listen, the waters of Noah and that rainbow that appeared, the rainbow is God's. Isn't it interesting, the pride uh, rainbow, they took out one of the colors, you know? And, and they didn't create the rainbow. God did. And all the devil ever does is pervert anything. But here's the point. God set that rainbow as a standard that he will always have a redemptive plan. But he needs a Noah. He needs a Moses. He needs you to stand in a place when it's evil, when it's corrupt, to stand for his mercy and to stand for his redemptive plan. All right, I like this part. Verse 10, watch what he says. For the mountains shall depart and the hills will be removed, but my kindness will not depart from you. Neither shall, watch the covenant, covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord that has mercy on you. So he's saying, look, you're going to see mountains depart. You're going to see some shakings. You're going to see some troubling times in your life, but don't ever forget my consistent character. Don't ever forget, as long as my spirit is in the earth, I will help you. I will help your nation if you will call unto me. I will absolutely bring you a plan of help if you personally need it, if your family needs it, if your city needs it. How about this? How about if your nation needs it? And all God needs is somebody to remind him of that covenant. And that's what Moses did. Okay, so let's go on. I want to show you Luke 21. This is something, and we're being a little repetitive, but this is very important. I've learned this. No matter what you face in life, no matter what you hear on the TV, no matter what you read, the headlines. By the way, a lot of it is clickbait. They just want you to, you know, click on. And it's amazing how, and, and I am really believing there's going to be a new day of media coming to us. Um, where, you know, they don't create the news. Right? Aren't you tired of that? Used to be where you, you know, growing up with Walter Cronkite. Remember? Walter Cronkite. Remember that? Or Paul Harvey. Good day. Remember that guy? I mean, they, they just told the news. They didn't try to spin it and, you know, create it, right? Like they do today. I mean, they lie. And so you, you're never getting truth. You're just getting a bunch of spin. Right? Yeah. All right. So here's the principle. There's going to be signs in the sun, eclipses. There's going to be moons, even blood moons. And there's going to be signs even in the stars. And upon the earth, there's going to be distress of nations. And it's going to be with perplexity. You're even going to see the, the sea and the waves begin to roar. But notice what Jesus said. Keep reading. He says, and men's hearts are going to fail for them because of fear. You know, there's more linkage to heart attacks and fear. And they're saying it's on the rise because people get wigged out. They listen to too much disinformation. They listen to too much negativity and it affects their very heart. And that's what Jesus said. Be careful what you're listening to. Be careful what you're putting your eyes on because it'll affect you. And it'll affect you so much where you will begin to question God's character even. You'll, you'll think that evil has a greater upper hand than the divine ability of God to come and to deal with evil and to turn things around that quick. Amen? That's why I was really glad on Flashpoint. I was on with uh, that former ambassador to Israel, uh, Ambassador Friedman, and he said, once 45 comes back, he said, everything, he said, you don't realize how quickly everything will change and can change. It's, it's not difficult. 
And God's saying, look, don't get wigged out. I have a redemptive plan. Now watch this. Men's hearts are going to fill them for fear because they look at things which are coming on the earth. Now stop right here. Look at the next thing. The powers of heaven shall be shaken. Do you really think for a moment that all of a sudden Gabriel and Michael are going to be shaken. Do you really think for a moment when you get up into heaven and you see your mansion has got cracks in it and God says, oh, you remember when there was sun, moon, and the stars? And you remember when there was nations in perplexity and the sea was roaring? Well, I shook the heavens and I'm sorry it cracked some of your house. He's not talking about that. He's not talking about heaven. He's not talking about the angelic realm. He's talking about principalities and powers and devils and their systems and their, their agendas. He's saying, when you see these things, realize. Now listen to me. Part of my redemptive plan is when you see all of these things, I am dealing with unseen forces of darkness. And I'll shake them. And I will make the devil pay if my covenant people in the earth will be like David. Who will stand up in a time of fear. Who will stand up in a time of lying intimidation from the fake media. And say, who are you that challenges the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? You will not take our country and its freedom from us. All God needs is you. And he's saying the powers of heaven will be shaken. When you see these things, don't think that God is somehow removed. That's when God begins to shake it up. Man, there was a song, and I hope this is not perverted. Shake it up, baby. Shake it on up. If that's perverted, forgive me. I'm singing it in Holy Ghost right now. Because I don't even know that song. I just don't even, I've never listened to it that I remember, except maybe once. Shake it up, baby. Shake it on up. Get, I, I, Twist and shout. Come on, come on, baby. Twist and shout. Come on, come on, come on. Shake it up, baby. Shake it on. All the millennials are going. Man, I'm seeing the grannies going. That's the only time I saw some of the grannies in the back section ever move. No, I'm just teasing. I'm only messing with you. Do y'all remember that song? Who wrote it? Oh, I don't know what's the name of the band? Okay. I don't know. But all I know is when I twisted, I shouted because I felt that in my ribs. Okay. All right. For the powers of heaven will be shaken every devil, every demon. Now watch what Jesus says. Verse 27. Now this is important because eschatology and end time theology has made it seem like this is only a one time event. When you see signs in the sun, the moon and the stars, and the nations in perplexity, the powers of heaven will be shaken, but it won't ever happen before the second coming. No, no, I'm showing you a pattern. And you will see the Son of Man coming. Stop right there. Yes, it's talking about the return of our King. But it's everything. Listen, that statement right there, you can underline it. When it looked like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were absolutely going to be burnt toast, there was no hope. Can you imagine if you're in the audience and these three Hebrew boys got thrown into a fiery furnace, they turn it up seven times hotter, and all the people that were turning it up, Fauci and all, oh, I'm sorry, that was the wrong, wrong time, <laughs> turning it up. All of a sudden, they dropped. You would think, oh, it's done for those three Hebrew boys. You better bow. But God came. They saw the Son of Man coming. They saw intervention. Can you imagine Daniel thrown into the lion's den? Oh, my gosh. Bartholomew was thrown in there a week ago, and his bones are no more. We love Daniel. We appreciate Daniel. They sang songs of mourning about Daniel. Right? Some created that song. Feelings. <laughs> Feelings. And all of a sudden the next day, Daniel comes out. And they're like, I can just see the Hebrews. Oh, 
How in the world did you come out of the alliance then? It is not possible. No, no, we've never seen this in all of the Israel's history. And Daniel stood up. And he did his best Don Knotts. <laughs> well, the reason those lions couldn't touch me <laughs> is because I proclaimed a Daniel fast. <laughs> I mean, you think about that. Go back to our scripture. You will see the Son of Man coming. Who appeared in that lion's den? The Lion of Judah. He was greater than any lion because he created them. See, you have to understand who's greater, the clay or the one that made the clay. Quit, quit thinking that the deep state is stronger than Almighty God. Now, you will see when it gets ugly outside, when it gets nasty out there, when it looks like there is no hope, that's when God rises up. Amen? Most of us, we don't pray until something happens where we need to pray. I've been pastoring for a lot of years, and I've seen that consistency in people. That's, they don't pray unless something they need to pray. Then they call me and ask me to help them. I don't mind helping, but it's just you got to have a consistency on your own. So there's a principle. When things get crazy, you will see God come. And notice what he says. In a cloud with power and great glory. Stop right there. Do you know, historically, you can look at World War I and World War II, and as nasty and ugly as that was, it was tied to something historically called the healing revivals. Right? The moves of God that came at the same time. You can study this historically. Gene Bailey uh, has taught a lot about this. But here's the point. Notice when there's stuff going that's crazy in the earth, the powers of heaven will be shaken. God will deal with the devil, but he needs somebody. And watch this. You're, you'll see God's intervention. You'll see the Son of Man intervening. And he'll come with power and great glory. So write this down. Never forget when it's rough, the glory factor. Look at Joel chapter 2, verse 2. You have to remember this. This all ties in to God having a redemptive plan. All right, here we go. It's a day of darkness and of gloominess. People say, oh, see, right there. Nobody's denying it's a day of darkness. Nobody's denying that it's a day of gloominess. But then it says a day of clouds and thick darkness. Underline a day of clouds and thick darkness. All right. The reason you have to understand that that's not speaking the same thing, because the day of darkness and the day of gloominess is talking about an evil day. But then it talks about the redemptive plan. And the days of clouds and thick darkness are the same exact Hebrew words when you read in the book of Exodus chapter 19 through 21, where God shows up, and it says how God shows up. He showed up in clouds and thick darkness. The Bible says when Moses went to meet God, he met God in clouds and thick darkness. In 2 Chronicles 5, verse 13, when they began to say, the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever, you flip to the next chapter. 2 Chronicles 6, verse 1, the exact next verse. All of a sudden, God shows up in his glory, and Solomon says, this dark cloud is the Shekinah. The glory of God. So what is God trying to say? When you see darkness and gloominess, that's when you'll see the Lord come. Come on. Every day when God created something, it always started when it was dark. So the evening and the morning were the first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day. Consistently, God rolls up his sleeves. That's when he goes to work, when it's dark. Come on. So why are we counting out God from our country? Why are you counting God out for your marriage that's struggling? Why are you counting God out of the pain that's in your body or the sickness that you're facing? Come on. That's when it, God rises. All right, look at the Isaiah 60 factor. Look at verse 1 through 3. Again, the glory factor. Arise, shine, for the light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. That's the clouds and thick darkness. Look at verse 2. 
Look at the conditions. It's dark. It's gloomy. Darkness will cover the earth. Gross darkness will even be upon people. And we've seen how gross darkness is on people. But the Lord, you've got to underline the word uh, but. But the Lord. But the Lord. Yeah, that might be happening. The waves might be roaring. The sea. You, you might see nations in perplexity. But the king will come in power and in glory because as long as the spirit of God is in the earth, he always has a plan of help and hope. And the Lord shall arise upon you. And his what? His glory shall be seen on you. And it's not just for the church. Keep reading. Verse 3. Now God is getting involved in politics. And Gentiles shall come to thy light and governments, kings, politicians will come to the brightness of thy rising. How many of you see this? All right. Look at Acts chapter 2, verses 19 through 21. We read these. And I'll show wonders in heaven above. And I'm going to show you Peter prophesying signs in the earth beneath. And there's going to be blood. There's going to be fire. And there's vapor of smoke. Oh, I hate the last days. But wait a minute. You have to look at that. Okay. Yeah, there might be bloodshed. We've seen that. We saw fires when they're burning down cities. We saw vapors of smoke. But do you know when you look at those three words, those are also redemptive? Yes. Come on, what about the blood of Jesus? Yeah. What about there'll be signs in the earth beneath, and there's going to be in the earth beneath mass salvations through yes. the blood. Come on, that's why you're going out. Yep. Sure, yep. Street witnessing tomorrow. Because there's going to be signs in the earth of our blood covenant of people getting saved and healed. There's going to be fire. What does fire represent? Come on, Pentecost. We just celebrated the Feast of Pentecost. You think he only showed up one time with fire that settled upon their heads? No, there's coming another fire that's going to cleanse his people. And that judgment will start in the house of God. And vapor of smoke. What's the vapor of smoke? It's the redemptive side of Darkness, gross darkness, vapor of smoke is the cloud. It's the presence. It's the glory of God. Keep reading verse 20. And then he says, and the sun will be turned into darkness. So when you're seeing blood moons and you're seeing eclipse, quit looking for all the natural blood. Oh, there's going to be civil war. No, start looking for redemption. Oh, that's when people are going to get saved, the blood. Oh, that's when the fire is going to come and deal with injustice and deal with corruption and evil through the fire of your Holy Ghost. Yeah, but what about the moon, the moon turning blood red? Uh, that's when you're going to see vapor of smoke. That's when you're going to see God show up in glory. And there's going to be global awakening and revival and reform before the great and notable day of the Lord. Do you think God can ever have a great notable day before he comes? Yes. If you don't believe that, why go to church? I just go there to go there. No, you're hoping something great and notable will take place. Right? You are all real slow. It must be Father's Day, and you're all thinking about your fluffy pillow. <laughs> Look at verse 21. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. What's the result? Man, you talk about awakening, global salvation. So you cannot forget, go back to Luke 21, verse 27, what Jesus said. You're going to see me come. You're going to see me show up like I did in Daniel's den. You're going to see me show up like I did in the fiery furnace. And you're going to see the Son of Man coming in cloud of glory with power and great glory. Now watch. Here's the, here's the thing. Never forget this. Verse 28. You have to get this down. And when you see things that are bad and evil, always know the glory factor. Always know that God then, when it's dark, it's when he rolls up his sleeves and he works. Because, look up. Adjust your perspective. Adjust what you're looking at. Adjust who you're looking at. Adjust what you believe and who you believe. Look up. Look up. Look up to Jesus. Look up to God. And lift up your heads. Come on, don't put your heads down. Christians that come in that lets everybody know what their problem is on Sundays, you don't know God. Because the Bible says, in the presence of God, there's much joy. Now, I'm not saying that you're not praying. You just, you need to, you got you to get to know God. Because it'll knock that stuff off of you. And the God that I know, he won't put up with that with me. You know how hard it's been these almost four years? Just my schedule alone to do what God asked me to do. I'm like, "Uh uh-uh. But you know what? He won't let me get by with it. He won't. 
I tried to, I, I, I won't go into great detail, but I had, how many remember the story of Jacob where he wrestled with God? I had the Lord come in on me one morning at 2.30 in the morning. I don't often talk about this. This was two years ago. And I was ready to just say I could care less about, I, I, Lord, I just, I'm tired of everyone's nastiness. I'm just going to go back and call everyone friends and countrymen. Right? Be Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood Christian Center. And the Lord came in, and I wrestled with him in my soul. It was the most excruciating, physical, spiritual, solical wrestling that I've ever witnessed. And guess who won? <laughs> guess who won? He did. <laughs> so, he did. But I told him, I said, God, I can't. He said, don't you quit. I need your office. I need you. All right, are you listening? All right, so don't put your head down. Why? Because your redemption draws nigh. That's when it's a prophetic indicator that the God of redemption, of help and hope is right there. All right, so what does God do? He always has a redemptive plan. When the waters of Noah, it represents a redemptive plan. I'm going to go through these very quickly. Number one, God always deals with corruption. He always deals with evil. Genesis 6, 5 through 7. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of their heart were on evil continually. And it repented the Lord. And it grieved him in his heart. Here's what God needs. If you're going to carry a redemptive plan out greater than your own life, but it does include your life, and you want to affect your city, your neighborhood, you got to be about God's heart. Love what he loves. Hate what he hates. And ask him. Say, God, don't let me get by with things. God, I want to know when I, when I hurt you. Please let me know. Be careful when you ask him that because, man, you will walk in a whole other realm of spiritual sensitivity. And you won't know why things are bothering you. You have to be careful because everybody will accuse you of being a grouch. But it's because you're carrying the burden of the Lord. Brenda has to live with that. She knows. Don't you, Brenda? But I'm doing good, right? Thank you, Brenda. It's Father's Day. You're supposed to say that. All right. So number one, God always deals with corruption. Number two, God always has a redemptive plan. Okay? Number three. God always looks for someone to carry out that redemptive plan. Look at Genesis 6, verse 8 through 10. But Noah found favor with God. So who was going to carry out his redemptive plan? Noah. Noah was going to carry out the redemptive plan of help and hope. And you know what? Everybody alive at the time. Now, there's different theological debates when the Bible says that Noah was a righteous man. Some are believing that he didn't carry the Nephilim uh, DNA where the angels came down and, and uh, slept with the, the daughters of men. And that he was righteous because he didn't have mixed seed. Whether that's part of it might be. But also, I think it's in principle. Because the reason I believe that is Jesus said in Luke uh, 17, he said the Son of Man is going to be rejected of his generation. And he said it'll, it'll be just like the days of Noah. Well, do you think that if you told everybody that it's going to rain and that they're going to miss the boat and God's going to judge their evil and wickedness, and you did that for 120 years, do you think that people would reject you? You have to understand something about Noah. He wasn't a meteorologist. He didn't show up, and today it's going to rain. <laughs> and right over here in the earth section over the mountains, they're going to all be covered, including Ararat and all the mountains down into the East Asia. Over there in North America, in fact, South America and Africa are connected. But when this rain comes, they will be divided over here through a front that will push. The fountains of the deep that will break open. <laughs> I mean, you really think so? He wasn't a meteorologist. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. You are all like so quiet. I, there, there's some great material here today. <laughs> you know, it's just like... But the difference is I just live in my own world. <laughs> all right, look at this. He wasn't a meteorologist. Look at what the Bible says. And he, God spared not the old world, but he saved Noah, the eighth person. The eighth person. Now, I believe because Noah was rejected in his, in his generation, that's what Jesus said. I believe that he was, out of all the people created since Adam, he was the eighth one that God could find righteousness in him. So if you want to carry out a redemptive plan, if you want God's plan of help and hope, don't discount yourself. One man, Moses, changed 
the destiny of a nation. Because he got in the face of God and said, no, God, your mercy must triumph over judgment. Because God wanted to wipe them all out in Exodus 32. All right, so Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of what? Notice he didn't call him a meteorologist. He was a what? Okay, he was a preacher. But notice what his message was. Stop right there. His message was, it says it, righteousness. Do you know righteousness preachers always get a bad rap? Come on, remember the user-friendly movement that happened? Just come as you are. Stay as you are. Don't offend anyone. Don't make anyone nervous and don't let the services go long because people won't come. And don't preach about their sin. Have a filthy, dirty, ugly church. Right? And yet Jesus goes, hold it. I'm coming for a church without spot, blemish, or wrinkle. And you're just letting the people live how they want. Come as you are, stay as you are. Don't make anybody nervous. No, that's not according to the commander-in-chief, Jesus. He said, I'm coming for a church that don't have sin in it. They're not living evil. That's why when he was comparing the generation in Matthew 7, uh, uh, Matthew 11, he said, what shall we liken? That's what they asked him. Jesus, what shall we compare this generation to? He goes, oh, you want me to compare this generation? I'm going to tell you the mindset of these Jerusalem millennials. Right? He said, what did you come out to see? A uh, reed bending in the wind? In other words, whatever the direction of the trend, that's the direction the pastor and his church goes. Right? If you have drive through restaurants, you better have a quick message because people, their attention span in the hour of microwaves. <laughs> God's coming for a clean church. In fact, uh, last week, y'all see uh, James Ward's jacket, that red jacket. I said, oh, man, that's Cornhusker. He goes, no, man, roll tide. I said, I didn't know that you were really into detergent. <laughs> I thought he wasn't going to come out here and preach after that because, you know, Alabama. But anyway, let's just go on with our message here. And he said, a pre let's stop. <laughs> okay, here we go. And a preacher of righteousness. He was a preacher. So in other words, he was confronting culture. He was confronting sin. He was confronting evil. Otherwise, it, he would have just said, he's a preacher. Yeah, but what was his message? Yeah. Righteousness. Why was it a message of righteousness? Because God had to counter yeah. what was happening in the culture. So don't get mad at preachers when they stand up and they're unafraid to speak out against the culture. Like woke. Right? Okay, four people. Thank you. It's so good to have you back from Florida. I needed that one clap again. It when you guys go down there for the winter, it's so quiet in here, Karen. It's just like, yeah. It's almost like Monk Christian Center or something. Okay, all right, let's go on. So God always needs somebody. Say, God, God. can count on me. All right. The next thing God uses is his church. All right, look at Genesis 6. I'm going to show you an Old Testament example of verse 13 and through 14. All right, God said, I'm going to destroy all flesh because the world is full of violence. Build an ark. Now, do you know Noah's ark is a type of the church? Make it of gopher wood with rooms inside with three decks and one door because Jesus is the only way, truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except through him. Cover it in and out with pitch. Now, all you College World Series fans, that's your baseball. Now, look at verse 15. Look at what he said. When you make this ark, make the length of it 300 cubits. All right, you have to understand. He's saying, I don't want just my church. My, in other words, it's not just the church, you know, the, the deadbeats out there, or the lukewarm Christians or the pastors that won't be a preacher of righteousness. They, they ignore the culture, right? They ignore the evil. They act like it's not happening because they don't want to inject themselves into it. But when God looks for someone, he also looks for those in his church. It's called the remnant. How many are familiar with that? Romans 9 said, man, we would be like Sodom and Gomorrah unless God left a remnant. How many of you ever put carpet in your home? Okay, your apartment. How many of you ever put carpet in your car? I had one car, a car I had a rust on it, and I had to put shag carpet. I just cut a piece off, put it in there, but I had carpet, man. But, but it was from a remnant. It was from a leftover. Are you here today? Okay. 
All right, so 300 speaks of a remnant. How many out of 32,000 of the army of Gideon did it finally come down to? 300. And why were they chosen? It wasn't how they drank water. That was part is how they used their tongue. And if they used their tongue correctly. If you want to be part of the remnant, what are you speaking over your nation, your life, your neighborhood? Number one. Number two, how are you using your tongue? Do you pray in tongues? Prove it. Okay, I'm convinced now. I'm convinced now. I'm convinced. All right, notice the breath. Okay, that would be the depth of it, 50. All right, what's the number of Pentecost? 50. 50. Oh, by the way, go back up to 300. The number 300 is also connected to victory because there was one of David's mighty men in 1 Chronicles 12 that took out with one sword 300 men. When uh, uh, Samson in the book of Judges was going to take out the Philistines, the Bible said he tied 300 foxtails together and threw them into the camp of the Philistines. All right, what did Judas accuse the woman who had the alabaster box of precious, costly anointing? He said, why are you going to waste? That thing is worth 300 dinar e, not dinar, that was a rack, dinar e. All right? Because it represents a breaking. It represents those who bring breakthrough. That's what that alabaster box and all of that, the anointing and blah, blah, blah. But 50 represents Holy Spirit. God wants a remnant as part of his redemptive plan. But he also wants there to be this Holy Spirit company of people who know how to pray in tongues, who know how to release the Holy Spirit, who know how to pray for God's glory to come. Because whenever the powers of heaven are shaken, God needs those who can pull that glory into manifestation. And it requires a remnant people saying, we don't care about schedule. We don't care about the watch. We don't, we don't care about those. We are so hungry for God. Right? 30. 30 is a mature church. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians 4, he put apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to do what? Equip you, the saints, to do the work of the ministry till you come unto a what kind of man? A mature. 30 is the number that's considered in the Bible for maturity. Right? Jesus came into ministry at 30 years of age. John the Baptist came into ministry 30 years of age. Ezekiel shifted from a priesthood over into a prophetic mantle at 30 years of age. Uh, there's another one. But anyway, you'll get it. So, I mean, I've had, you know, over the last four years, lines, people shooting each other. And I'm like, calling that person out or getting a discourse in the body of Christ is more important than people that are uh, killing babies in the womb, outside of the womb, uh, uh, sexually exploiting our children, putting sexual uh, explicit material. That's your real enemy, socialism. Rather than just calling people out and fighting among ourselves. All right, that's a different message. I already did, but I'll do another one. Okay, so there you go. All right, now, here's another one. God always brings separation. Write that down. I'm almost done with my message. I don't want to preach this one again. God always brings separation. Genesis 7, 2 through 3. God also told Noah, take with you seven pairs, all clean animals, and mate, and a pair of animals that are not clean. The male and his mate. Notice God. Absolutely. There was no gender confusion. You never read where Noah, man, God, the reason it's taken 120 years, I can't figure out which one's a male and which one's a female. There's only two. Not hard. So there's a separation between clean and unclean. When God begins to release a redemptive plan, it will expose the world from his people. That's what you're seeing now. That's what he did with his redemptive plan of Exodus 8, 23. God says, I'm going to bring a separation between you, my people, and Egypt. And, 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 and in the expanded edition, it says, and it will be a redemptive thing. Because whenever God brings a redemptive plan, there will always be a call for separation. You cannot be among the unclean. Now, it doesn't mean that the unclean can't come into your church, right? It just means they can't stay there. Acts 17, 30, what did Paul say? It is commanded, it is commanded, not a suggestion, that all men, Acts 17, 30, are to repent everywhere. That's what it was. It was a command. All right? So God brings separation. Number five, God begins to save your family. Look at Hebrews 11 verse 7. Come on, some of your family, they have, they have done nothing but withstand you, been evil, uh, they they've, they've think you're crazy. 
When God's redemptive plan begins to really be carried out, there will be a saving of your family. God, again, God will reach out with a plan of help and hope, and they'll be awakened. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Come on, Acts 16, 31. The jailer, it was declared to him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved, you and your family as well. Have you ever studied Luke 15? If you go back to Luke 15, this is your homework and those of you that are watching. Jesus is talking among the Pharisees and they're debating him about, you know, who's a sinner and he sits with sinners. And Jesus said, let me, let me tell you a story. And he, he shares three stories. Number one, he talks about uh, there being a hundred sheep. And one of those sheep begin to wander off. And Jesus says, shall not that one. Jesus, shall not, shall not the, 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 the shepherd go after that one and do what? Bring him back into the fold. So what he's talking about, you got to look at the whole chapter in context too. Yes, it does apply that he goes after the backslidden, he goes after the wanderer, but it's also household salvation. The hundred represents the house of God or your house. And if you have a stray husband, a stray wife, uh, a stray cat, my cat, you know, just he doesn't really report about the cat. Most of them just kind of just leave him alone, and they'll come back, right? But, but the point is, he's talking about if you have a stray son, a stray daughter, a stray child, you, it, there's a time where they will be brought back into the household. Because then he goes on, he says, "All right, there's a woman. She has ten coins, and uh, she loses one in her what? Her house." So he's talking about household salvation, and he says, "One of those coins she can't find. She sweeps the whole." house but there's still there's still a brother that doesn't know the lord won't she frantically continue to search pray call out to god for that one lost soul coin of the house then he finishes the story and he says luke 15 he says hey there was a a, a young young man who wanted his inheritance. And he goes and he demands it. The father gives it to him. He goes and he squanders it. He begins to uh, mess around with wrong people and women. And he, and he begins to uh, demoralize himself to a point of eating among the pigs. And finally, he comes to the end of himself. And he goes back to his what? House. He's the lost person. The lost sheep, the lost coin, he represents the household. Come on, start believing for your relatives. Start believing for your brothers and sisters, your sons and daughters, your wives, whoever. Amen? Don't discount it because part of when God's redemptive plan is in the earth, not only part of that glory that comes for signs and wonders is so that your family can all come into salvation. All right, let's end with this, Pastor Doug. All right, the other thing is, uh, when, the, when uh, the redemptive plan of God comes, there'll be a global outpouring, okay? And that's what happened. Remember, the fountains of the deep, Genesis 7, were broken open, and God brought rain. And it rained, and it rained, and it rained. And you have to understand, when we say, let it rain, yeah, sometimes we're saying because, you know, it's drought. But Hosea chapter 6, verse 3 uh, the Bible calls God. It says he shall come as the rain. The Bible says that there is a former rain and a latter rain, speaking of the Holy Spirit's outpouring. So when God's redemptive plan is in the earth, again, the powers of heaven will be shaken and you will what? See the Son of Man coming in great power and glory. That's what also the waters of Noah represent, the days of Noah, a global outpouring. I am looking and I am beginning to see the beginning of that global outpouring. All right, the next one, you will see that the things in the earth will go back to a place of reset. Genesis seven, uh, 8, it says, and the, uh, 1 through 5, the waters flooded the earth for 150 days. And God remembered Noah and the animals on the ark. And the waters receded. Come on. We aren't going to see this level through our courts in the future that I see with these eyes. We're not going to see the stuff like we've seen through Congress and Senate. I see something different. We're not going to see this buffoonery in the White House. We're not going to see this high economy. We're not going to see these open borders. Why? Because I see something receding. 
morning, and, and, I, and I literally, I don't know if you've ever had this sensation happen to you. It's kind of freaky. But I felt something grab my hair and pull me up, and I knew it was the hand of God. I don't know how to explain it. And, and I was like, God, give me a Bible verse. And about two weeks later, I saw that that happened to Ezekiel. I'm not saying I'm Ezekiel. I'm just saying that I had a biblical example of what I felt happened to me. And I was carried up over the earth, and I was looking down on the earth, and I, and I could see such darkness, and I was like shaking. I was like, God, this is so dark. And I heard this very authoritative voice. And I don't know if it was the voice, Lord, you've never really told me if it was you or whatever, but I mean, we can talk about that later. But the point is, it was a very authoritative voice, probably like I've not heard in a while. And it said, uh, divine reset, divine reversals. It was so authoritative. And when, when it said it, all of a sudden I said it, divine reversals, divine reset. And bam, I saw this darkness that was on the earth. It's like this big, massive fireball hit it, and it just like, the darkness started dissipating. There is coming a receding where things, they don't necessarily go back to normal, but they sure as heck aren't like it has been. All right? Yep, that's what I say. 